coming up. Dragons to Bigfoot to modern dinosaurs, could legendary creatures actually be real? Are there monsters in our midst? Compelling evidence has set off a contentious debate. If the Patterson film is real, and here this is with a very, very big qualified if, it is one of the most important scientific documents of the last hundred years. In addition to film, there are eyewitness accounts and giant footprints, many leading in the direction of a disturbing possibility. The fact is that there are still monsters in the 21st century. It doesn't really matter if we need them or not. They're there, and it's a matter of fact. Is there a huge and hairy beast called Bigfoot prowling the Pacific Northwest? Or living dinosaurs in the swamps of the Congo? And did dragons once walk the Earth? There have always been reports of terrifying beasts, stories that can easily be explained as the result of overactive imaginations. But could at least a few of these creatures have some basis in fact? Join us for Bigfoot and Other Monsters. Monsters. For most of us, they are the stuff of bedtime stories, campfire scares, and horror movies, not real life. Or are they? Is it possible that the monsters of legend might just turn out to be terrifyingly real? Are there uh, objective origins for monsters? Possibly. Uh, I happen to be one of those uh, who think that myths and folk tales and legends do not come totally out of nothing. They're usually triggered by something, an attempt to explain something. What if the creatures we consider to be monstrous are nothing more than undiscovered species of animals? Cryptozoology, a fringe element of mainstream zoology, deals with just such concerns. Derived from the Latin, the word means the study of hidden animals. Cryptozoology is the evaluation of evidence for animals, animals that are reported, that have not been scientifically verified or validated. That is, um, animals that are, are known to us through eyewitness reports or folklore. Cryptozoology is an intellectual pursuit for the curious. There are no schools for cryptozoologists, nor degrees to be earned. The man considered the father of cryptozoology is French zoologist Bernard Houvelmans. His landmark book on the track of unknown animals was first published in 1955. It discussed the existence of animals both mundane, like the giant anaconda, and more exotic, like the abominable snowman of the Himalayas. The book inspired adventurers and scientists alike to seek out some of these hidden animals. So the scholarly way he went about things uh, was able to impress many other scientists that said, well, gee, maybe there is something to this after all. Time and time again in the last century, Animals that were thought to exist only as myth or in folklore were discovered to be real. The giant panda, the okapi, and the megamouth shark are only a few of the larger ones found. In investigating accounts that seem impossible, the cryptozoologists have helped to expand the known animal kingdom. Cryptozoological claims should really be looked at in the same way as any other scientific claim. You've got to remember things like uh, the giant squid were fantasy for many, many years until a specimen turned up. If the giant squid can turn out to be real, what about other creatures of legend? Are real monsters simply undiscovered animals? The forest of the Pacific Northwest covers some 50,000 square miles of land. Here, dense wilderness rubs shoulders with major population centers. And here is where thousands of eyewitnesses have claimed to have seen the creature known as Bigfoot. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, as it's known in Canada, 
um, is reported to be a large bipedal primate. And by that I mean it walks fully erect on, on two legs. It's very muscular and robust according to the reports. Seven, eight feet tall, covered with hair, has a very large stride and, and can move very rapidly. People have told stories about Bigfoot for hundreds of years, but it will take more than that to prove that Bigfoot is not just a legend. The burden of proof always lies with the person who is making the extraordinary claim. If you are making a claim about something that has never been seen before and there is no evidence of, it is incumbent upon you to produce evidence to convince other people. Early evidence of the Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, comes to us from the folklore of the indigenous peoples of North America. Well, the fact that we have uh, Native American legends of a creature called Sasquatch uh, and other names in various other dialects does lend credence to the possibility that there's something there, because if it's there, it's been there for a long, long time. Reports of man-beasts or wild men have appeared in North American newspapers since the 1830s and a British Columbian man named Albert Ostman claimed in a sworn affidavit to have been held captive by a family of Bigfoots in 1924. But the creature we know as Bigfoot leaps into the modern era when, in 1958, a construction crew in Bluff Creek Valley, California, discovers enormous human-looking footprints at their site, up to 18 inches long. Plaster casts are made of the prints, and they are brought to a local newspaper. The story spreads like wildfire, and soon more people claim to have seen a Bigfoot. Richard Greenwell of the International Society of Cryptozoologists has been on a number of Bigfoot fact-finding missions. These expeditions use modern technology like seismic motion detectors, infrared sensors, and night vision cameras to gather evidence for the existence of Bigfoot. We have uh, hundreds of cases of footprint tracks. We have many hair samples that have been collected, fecal remains, uh, of course hundreds and hundreds, over a thousand eyewitness reports, and recordings of howls and bellows. Perhaps the most interesting evidence for the existence of Bigfoot is the so-called Patterson film, shot by Bigfoot enthusiast Roger Patterson in 1967. These 952 frames of film, roughly 50 seconds long, may very well be the only existing photographic evidence of a Bigfoot. This creature seems to have little interest in Patterson as he films. Ape-like, it moves rapidly back into the cover of the deep forest, only to disappear from view. Most skeptics don't believe that the Patterson film is authentic, but the image of the Bigfoot is indelibly etched in our minds. If the Patterson film is real, and here this is with a very, very big qualified if, it is one of the most important scientific documents of the last hundred years. But evidence for the existence of Bigfoot is not restricted to North America. Similar creatures are reported across the world, often in the remote mountainous areas. The most famous is the Yeti, or abominable snowman, of the Himalayas. I certainly don't discount it as an anthropologist, that we may have some distant cousins lurking around in the more inaccessible parts of the planet. Although modern humans, Homo sapiens, were preceded by other hominid groups, we seem to stand alone in the animal kingdom as the only representative of our species. Or are we? And that's one reason why the possibility uh, that Bigfoot, the Yeti, the and the rest of these, these creatures may exist is that from a purely biological standpoint, really they ought to, they ought to be there. In fact, the most widely accepted theory is that Bigfoot and other analogs are a relic population of a prehistoric ape known as Gigantopithecus black eye. Fossil records indicate that it was around nine feet tall and weighed over 1,000 pounds matching most descriptions of Bigfoot. This ape lived in, in Asia, in China mainly, um, up to about 500,000 years ago. And so it's possible that it might have crossed the Bering Land Bridge 
like the North American Indian, Indians did, and come down to North, through North American forests and stayed hidden in the forest here. But there is still some doubt as to whether our North American Bigfoot is a Gigantopithecus, or even if it exists at all. Although I'm convinced that the Native American peoples brought a racial memory and legends of creatures like Gigantopithecus with them when they came across from cent Central Asia, there is no zoological evidence whatsoever that the animals themselves came across with them. In October 1967, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, two Bigfoot enthusiasts, set out in Bluff Creek, California. Inspired by the footprints found in the same spot in 1958, Patterson and Gimlin decide to shoot some background materials for a documentary they're making on the elusive creature. What they see amazes them. What they capture on film leaves the world asking, could it be? A tall, furry, bipedal animal strides away from the two men, turning once to look back at them and then disappears from sight into the woods. Could this be physical proof that a creature of legend like Bigfoot is actually a real monster? The 952 frames of color film are the subject of continuing debate. The Patterson film is either indisputable evidence for the existence of Bigfoot, or it is nothing more than smoke and mirrors a person in an ape costume. There are a lot of reasons not to believe it. One of the things that's very convenient to what I believe to be a hoax is the fact that it gets blurry in, a, in the right spot, that it's really hard to examine any close details of this, and that they didn't follow the uh, supposed Bigfoot walking away um, at a very doable pace. I've worked with all three of the great apes, the gorilla, the chimp, and the orangutan. This creature moves like an ape, even though it's a biped. The whole upper part of its body is massively muscular. When it turns back to look at the people that are filming it, it doesn't turn its head, it turns the whole upper part of its body. That's because apes can't turn their heads all the way around like we can to look over their shoulders. The shoulders are too massive. The whole feel of the creature is that of an ape. To the cryptozoologist, those who research and seek out hidden or unknown animals, the Patterson film is only one piece in a very large puzzle. There's various kinds of evidence today to support the existence of, of Bigfoot. Um, the evidence consists, first of all, mainly, of course, of eyewitness reports. We have about 1,500 good reports on July 15, 1989, my parents and I planned to go on a simple berry picking trip out into the wilderness. And it was just going to be a simple hike in the woods. Skip Fromback, a resident of Seattle, Washington, drives his family about 60 miles out of the city. Once out in the deep woods, he separates from the others. All of a sudden, the hill above me just explodes in a fury of action and I see this big black hairy thing come falling down through the trees, Rambo style, knocking the branches off as it comes down. And it lands in a heap up on the top of the hill and then begins to bound head over heels down the hillside, approximately an 80 foot fall down through the trees and another 150 feet down to where I was. He decides to fire a gunshot over the animal's shoulder to scare it away. What I did was I fired the shot by the time it had started to rise off of the ground. And this thing didn't rise off the ground like a bear would rise up on all four legs. I saw an arm go out from its left side, one go out from its right side, and then it pushed itself up like a human and flexed its back when it got to the top of its erect stance. From the angle that I was to this creature when it stood up, I got a fairly good look at the side of its face to the point where I could tell that it wasn't obviously a bear. It was some kind of a mountain gorilla or a gorilla type animal. It made a slight turn and looked in my direction. Then it turned around and walked away like I wasn't even there. From back waits 10 to 15 minutes, then begins to descend the path down the mountain where he encounters the beast again. This time, the animal begins to chase him down the hill. 
I was running for my life away from this thing, absolutely. It was the scariest thing I've ever come up against. And I ran until I was physically exhausted and I thought, I'm gonna let this thing kill me because I can't run anymore. And I'd stop and it would stop. And then I'd run again and it would chase me again. And it was like it was playing with me. Finally, the creature stops chasing Frombach about 300 feet from the road where he had parked his car. Battered and bleeding, he gathers his family together and leaves the area. For Skip Frombach, his alleged encounter with a Bigfoot did not end on the mountaintop. I don't make a habit of going out looking for Bigfoot. This thing found me, but until you have the experience, you can't appreciate where an actual eyewitness comes from and the trauma that they go through during this thing, even if it was hoaxed against them. The trauma that you live with day by day and for five years that haunted me uh, caused me to lose sleep and so forth. I believe a high percentage of people who make these claims believe what they saw. They're not trying to trick people, but they may be being fooled by other people or their eyes or something that they just don't know quite what they're looking at. What I saw out there to me was real and what I experienced was real and the terror I felt was real and that part of it beyond outside the box was real and there's nobody that's going to tell me different on that. If footprints, film evidence and eyewitness testimony are not enough to convince the scientific community that Bigfoot is indeed a real monster, is there anything that will? We don't have a body. I mean, if these things are out there and running around for as long as people say they have been, um, we ought to be able to find a dead one so at some point. We haven't found it yet, and uh, I don't think we're going to. Most animals, when they die, uh, they're never found. When animals die, that they get eaten, the meat gets eaten, the bones get dispersed. The, the idea of finding bones is really a straw man. Is Bigfoot a legend, or is it a real monster? Even more traditional academics debate this question. I know that what we make of Bigfoot and what we make of our interest in Bigfoot are themselves very real, whether or not there really is a Bigfoot. Paleontology, the study of fossils, teaches us that dinosaurs ruled the Earth 235 million years ago until a cataclysmic event, like a large asteroid hitting the Earth or severe volcanic eruptions, made the planet uninhabitable for these colossal creatures. They are believed to have become extinct some 65 million years ago. Science teaches us that the age of the dinosaurs is past, but it doesn't tell us about Mokele and Bembe. Mokele and Bembe is, is an animal reported in Central Africa, in, in the Congo Basin, um, that's said to inhabit the swamps, and it's described like a, a, a sauropod dinosaur, that is, uh, the kinds that had the big bulky bodies and, and the long necks and small heads. It's about 30 to 40 feet long, reddish brown in color, with a great long neck with a crest running down it. It's said to be a herbivore, but very dangerous and to destroy canoes with its lashing tail. The description of Mokele and Bembe matches that of a small Apatosaurus, the dinosaur formerly known as Brontosaurus. Mokele and Bembe, whose name means one who stops the flow of rivers, is believed to live in the Likuala Swamp and Lake Tele region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is a great place to hide 50,000 square miles of swamp and forest, no roads, hardly any humans to bother with. The Likuala Swamp really takes one back to primordial times. Um, I've been in lots of swamps around the world, and this one really made you feel you were back in the Cretaceous. I've flown over it, uh, I've been in it, but flying over it, as far as the eye can see from an aircraft, is, is rainforest. There really could be anything in there, and we wouldn't have the faintest notion of it. Strange reports from the Likuala region have been surfacing for hundreds of years, long before a concept of dinosaurs existed. In 1776, a French missionary, Abbe Proyard, 
claims to have seen giant three-toed animal footprints that were three feet across and seven feet apart from each other. Almost 150 years later, in 1913, a German expedition encountered natives of the region who described a strange herbivorous creature. It was said to be between the size of an elephant and a hippopotamus with a long, flexible neck. They called it Mokele Mbembe. Even as late as 1983, a Congolese biologist, Marceline Agnagna, claims to have seen the beast wading in the waters of Lake Tele. Despite a long history of sightings and eyewitness testimony, the idea of a living dinosaur in modern times is written off as just another native folktale and superstition. Western scientists or society in general do pay more credence to Western reports or accounts than they do from native accounts. Um, some people call that racist. Others have pointed out, well, there's folklore involved in native accounts, so it's harder to draw the line. Um, but if you look back in history, just about all the animals, the large animals that have been discovered, say, in the last 200 years, they were all known to native peoples. It's not a matter of, of taking the account of the African native any less seriously than taking the account of a visitor from another culture to Africa. It's a matter of knowing what to look for and where to look for it. I think that it is highly unlikely that Michele Mbembe is nothing more than a native superstition because the sightings, with very few exceptions, have not been imbued with any divine power. I think that in the absence of such corroborating quasi-religious evidence, the likelihood is that Michele Mbembe is a real animal. In the strictest scientific terms, then, could there be a dinosaur living in the Likuala Swamp? Could a species of dinosaur survived in the Congo forests for all, all those millions of years? It's not impossible. Um, the, the Congo forest has been there since then, so it's conceivable that a, a small population of these things could have remained there, a few dozen, a few hundred, uh, at different times surviving to the present. If it is a descendant of the dinosaurs, it wouldn't be, again, a carbon copy. Evolution goes on, and it would have adapted to the changing circumstances. It, either that, or it certainly would have adapted to whatever niche it finds itself in. Many experts agree that it is possible, if improbable, that Mokele Mbembe is a living dinosaur. Some offer other, more mundane explanations for what might be behind the sightings. The best explanation I've heard for Mokele and Bembe is elephants crossing streams and other areas of water with their trunks sticking out, which sounds an awful lot like some of these dinosaur descriptions. It seems to fit the same idea. Elephants and hippos are both known to the Baka pygmies and the other peoples of the Congo. They're very familiar with them. The Makola Membe is said to be something totally different, and in fact, it, it is said to actually kill both hippo and elephant. My best guess to the identity of the Makola Membe is that it is a large, long-necked, semi-aquatic monitor lizard. A 30-foot aquatic monitor lizard seems to make much more sense than a surviving dinosaur. Whatever may be at the root of the alleged Mokele Mbembe sightings, there are those who feel that more physical evidence of Mokele Mbembe should have turned up by now. It takes a population of dinosaurs to continue on through the ages. It's not just a pair, it's not just four of them. There needs to be a whole population. So you would think at some point, one of these animals would washed up on a shore or a carcass would have been found in the jungle or someone would have taken a real good picture of it because if they've always been around, something like that should have happened by now. There's something else that's hard to quantify and that's luck. You can just be in the right place at the right time or not. And that's very, very hard to predict when you're talking about 50,000 square miles and your expedition is going to penetrate maybe 10 or 20 or 30 linear miles, not square miles. So the odds are really against you. Greenwell traveled to the Likoala Swamp in 1981 in search of Mokele Mbembe. 
The expedition was led by University of Chicago biologist Roy Mackle, also a member of the International Society of Cryptozoologists. They were able to gather a number of eyewitness reports, but found no physical evidence of the creature. We did have an incident occur um, around the curve on a river where some large animal had just submerged and created a, a wake that hit our dugout. Uh, the natives were very upset and they were shouting that it's Mokeli and Bembe. We didn't actually see the animal. We just missed seeing it by, by a few seconds. So maybe it was Mokeli and Bembe, maybe it wasn't. Uh, we'll never know. <laughs> Dragons have infiltrated the human psyche for millennia. From ancient Babylonia to modern China, these fearsome beasts are an almost universal symbol, evident in cultures around the world. The dragon may have been, and continues to be, the first real monster. It has the jaws of a carnivore, it has scales from a reptile, it can swoop down out of the sky, some of them could breathe fire, it has claws, it represents a lot of the things that human beings fear or are repulsed by. So it's really the, the perfect enemy for any culture. The dragon that the ancient Babylonians worshipped was a mother figure, Tiamat, who had to be slain in order to create the heavens and the earth. In China, the Lung is revered as a symbol of good fortune and prosperity. The dragon tends to be beneficent. Uh, if you've ever seen a Chinese New Year celebration, you know that the dragon is a symbol of good luck. And that good luck, of course, is couched in the fact that in the folds of the dragon, this notion of, a, of an undulating being, are an image of the clouds. And without the clouds, you don't get the rain. Without the rain, you don't get the rice. Across the world from China, in ancient Mesoamerica, Another dragon is symbolized in the feathered serpent god of the Aztecs, Quetzalcoatl. This 12th century deity is associated with the sun. He is also credited with having brought the benefits of civilization to the ancient Mexican people. At the same time in medieval Europe, a very different image of the dragon is formed. Western dragons, if we think of, for example, the, the sinister dragons, the the monstrous dragons that heroes have to slay in some traditional stories are hoarding, avaricious, nasty, destructive, antisocial. Clearly, the dragon transcends the boundaries of cultures and continents. But what could have inspired these stories? Certainly, the fossil remains of dinosaurs and other large animals have been identified as dragons in the past. The irony is, of course, that the inhabitants were reconstructing as effectively living beasts, creatures that had died 70 million years earlier. But they didn't know that. Live reptiles, not dinosaurs, may have been equally responsible for inspiring tales of dragons. During the Crusades, savage animals never seen before in Europe were carted back from foreign lands as living trophies for the king. Many of these remarkable beasts, such as crocodiles and large snakes, could easily have been misidentified as dragons. During the Crusades, King Richard I brought back a crocodile to the menagerie, the Royal Menagerie in the Tower of London. This creature broke free, made its way to Suffolk and a town called Wormingford, where it wreaked havoc and killed both animals and people. But to the peasants, that would have been a dragon and was recorded as such. We human beings have an inherent uh, aversion, antipathy to uh, reptiles. And I think that's, this is part of our primate inheritance. I think we took it with us when we came down out of the trees, where our prime predator was the serpent. And I think it's no accident that a lot of our monsters are reptilian. Another fearsome candidate that may have inspired the legend of the dragon is the monitor lizard. Characterized by a long head and neck, heavy body and a long tail, these predators have roamed the earth since ancient times. A particularly large and fearsome species of monitor lizard is called the Komodo dragon. It was discovered as late as 1912 on a remote Indonesian island. These formidable predators have been measured at over 10 feet long and are extremely deadly to beast and human alike. 
Komodo dragons actually were given the right name because they're quite, uh, they're very large and they can be quite aggressive. It has razor sharp teeth and um, a, an infectious bite. If it attacks prey and the prey manages to tear free, the bite will be infected because the dragon's saliva is packed full of microorganisms that will cause the wound to rot and fester. So even if the prey escapes, the dragon can trail it with its acute sense of smell. Like the animals that may have inspired tales of the dragon, it is not uncommon for little known but perfectly mundane creatures to be misidentified as real monsters. Prior to its discovery in 1902, the mountain gorilla of Eastern Africa was thought to be a purely fictitious monster, a figment of the natives' overactive imagination. Well, the uh, discovery of the mountain gorilla was in many ways an accident. That is, no one was actually deliberately searching for mountain gorillas. In 1902, a captain in the German army, Oscar von Bering, is on a routine patrol along the disputed border between German East Africa and the Belgian Congo. The route takes Bering across some volcanic mountains called the Virungas. At one point, he spots a group of what looks like to him huge, hairy, human-like creatures. Captain von Bering actually shot uh, a couple of specimens of the mountain gorilla, the first one of which pitched down a chasm in the jungle and um, fell away into the undergrowth and was completely lost. And he managed to retrieve one of them and ship it back to, to Germany, where a taxonomist and scientist, or naturalist as they were called then, went to work on it basically, and uh, it was then properly classified as, as a new kind of gorilla, namely a mountain gorilla. What Captain von Bering has stumbled upon will bring to light a species of animal previously thought to be local folklore tales of an enormous animal with ferocious strengths and appetites. There were even tales of uh, these uh, apes lurking uh, near travel routes and then um, ambushing travelers along the way and again, once again, abducting young women uh, or, or killing the passengers. Both the mountain gorilla and the lowland gorilla were said to carry off native girls and rape them. They were also said to fight with elephants using trees as clubs, both of which are nonsense. We know that gorilla is quite a placid creature and less provoked. I suppose if I were a missionary and had no knowledge of apes, uh, and uh, by accident ran into a gorilla, my first thought would be monster. The stories of mountain gorillas coming out of the jungle to abduct young maidens are incorporated into the 1933 film classic, King Kong. This gigantic ape has a love interest. The writer of King Kong uh, relied on the available myths, uh, the stories that were available about, uh, about the apes, about the interaction between apes and humans, about certainly the potential interest on the part of the apes in, in, in human females. Native knowledge of the animals in their environment is, for the most part, disregarded by white colonials, even though the natives have lived alongside the mountain gorilla for years. The creatures they were describing couldn't possibly exist because the naturalists didn't know about them. And sadly, that is a view that prevails to today. A lot of uh, scientists will not believe in anything that they can't have on their dissecting tables. The island of Puerto Rico lies like a jewel glistening in the Caribbean Sea about a thousand miles southeast of Miami, Florida. A commonwealth of the United States, Puerto Rico may very well be the home of the newest real monster, a fierce predator known as the Chupacabras. I'm 50 years old and I've never seen anything like this. He put a lot of trauma on the neck. There wasn't only one attack, he took a lot of bites. Chupa Cabras, the name means goat sucker in Spanish and is derived from the manner in which this beast allegedly kills its victims. Victims of the Chupa Cabra are always killed in the same way. The bodies are found exsanguinated, that is drained completely of blood and often the liver and sometimes other internal organs have been removed. The Chubacabras is the Johnny-come-lately of the monster world. 
Watching the story spread is a modern day case study of how a myth is formed. In most earlier cultures, what we would call folklore was transmitted via word of mouth, by the oral tradition. But now, of course, we have television, we have films, we have radio. The chupacabra uh, partially got it, its boost uh, through, through the public and by use of the internet. I do think that the internet, in a way, has sort of replaced the, the more traditional way of storytelling. It's now become sort of the electronic campfire and probably less credible than, than what we used to hear from the elders and villages. The first attacks attributed to the Chupacabras began as late as 1995 in the town of Canovanas, and it is there that the creature is first described by eyewitnesses. The Chupacabra zoologically is a bit of a chimera. It's a mixture of the traits of different animals. It has porcupine-like spines, it bounds along like a kangaroo, it drinks blood like a vampire bat, it has reptilian skin, fangs, claws, strange big eyes like some bush baby or other nocturnal creature, and a long tongue like an anteater. It's really a zoological impossibility. Like the ancient tales of the dragon, the chupacabra seems to be an amalgam of all the most fearsome traits of the predator. It is this kind of mix and match description that troubles even those who devote themselves to finding other hidden or unknown creatures. We don't include the chupacabras in our list of cryptozoological animals or cryptids because we're not dealing with zoology. It's almost certainly uh, a folkloric animal. I would be very surprised if the chupacabra turned out to be real, and yet one needs to keep an open mind on all of these things because, in general, Myth doesn't come out of nowhere. Those who believe that the Chupacabras exists also tend to think it's not a natural entity as we know it. The Chupacabras resides in the realm of the unexplained. I'm convinced that the Chupacabra is very, very, very real and very frighteningly real. I would be amazed if it turned out to be a flesh and blood creature because the descriptions which eyewitnesses have given and the modus operandi of the killings bear no relation to anything that is known within accepted zoological parameters. While opinions vary as to what the chupacabras is, or might be, the question remains, what is killing the livestock? It seems that the local predators, in one form or another, are the ones responsible for the deaths of these animals. Dogs have been known to kill farm animals, uh, as have these other predators, so um, it's, it's really not that big of a deal for coyotes to be coming in and kill several chickens or to kill a goat or anything like that. A lot of the alleged victims of the chupacabra turn out to have been killed by mundane animals like dogs, but there are some which are very, very strange. They have one or two puncture marks in them and they're completely drained of blood. Often internal organs seem to have been sucked out through very small holes. Perhaps the most bizarre twist in the story of Chupacabras is that it seems to have become more of a popular figure than a terrifying monster. There were pop songs written about it, there were Chupacabra fast food joints, there were Chupacabra t-shirts. The, the Chupacabra is, is for many members of the Mexican-American community, for example, a symbol of, of pride in being Mexican-American and having the Mexican heritage. This doesn't make the chupacabra any the less real or believable. There is something that is yet to be identified that has been seen by a hell of a lot of people that kills animals in a way that I as a zoologist know that no known animal kills. Cryptozoologists are confident that the evidence of real monsters in our midst will continue to grow. More often than not, however, they say, that same evidence is ignored by the scientific establishment. There's actually very few scientists now at all looking for new species. And trying to look for large new species is considered often practically eccentric. Eccentric or not, there will always be people who search the shadows for Bigfoot or brave the jungle to find Mokele Mbembe, the living dinosaur. 
The hunt for clues and the desire to bring the unknown into the light is as much a part of us all as our love and fear of real monsters. I don't know that I'd be happy if any of these monsters would turn out to be real. It would take away some of the mystery that adheres to the very figure of the monster. I don't think a monster is all that monstrous once it's scientific fact. I think that mankind has a need to fear. And as the world gets more and more explained within terms of rational scientific viewpoints, mankind needs to have monsters. It needs to have something to be afraid of. The fact is that there are still monsters in the 21st century. It doesn't really matter if we need them or not. They're there, and it's a matter of fact. As late as August 2000, an alleged Bigfoot sighting was being investigated in Louisiana, and the skeletal remains of a strange animal thought to be the chupacabras was examined at the University of Nicaragua at Leon. Scientists there determined the animal was a wild dog. But the fact that science is taking a hard look at what we call monsters tells us that some legends might be true. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com.